Hi, I'm Jared, and today I will be reviewing Ravenna, Capital of Empire, Crucible of Europe, written by Judith Heron and published by Princeton University Press in 2020. Now, I read Ravenna earlier this year and thoroughly enjoyed it, which is what motivated me to record and post a review of this book. Judith Heron is a professor at King's College London of late antique and Byzantine history, so she is a recognized authority worldwide on this subject, uh, which makes the book itself all the more sort of um, authoritative and uh, engrossing because you know this is someone who has um, invested a, an entire career's worth of research into books like this. So the first thing that you notice when you pick up a hard copy of the book Ravenna is the beautiful cover. It's decorated by um, these mosaic tiles on the top and the bottom and on the back. Um, and those will come up again. They come up throughout the book. It's a recurring motif and is related to the mosaic work that exists in Ravenna. The second thing that you notice is, is the size. It's a, it's a pretty hefty tome. It's about 400 pages, um, but that comes with a, a good amount of you know, index and um, references and acknowledgments and things at the back. Um, but still, when you read all the way through it, it's about 400 pages. Um, the third thing that you'll notice when you pick up a hard copy cover of, or a copy of the book is not just one, not just two, not just three, but indeed four full color um, multi-page photo image inserts in the book. Now, this is something that you do see from time to time in history books of this nature um, and other nonfiction works of this nature um, that are really trying to bring a specific place or a specific period or a specific set of items to life. Um, and that is done to really great effect in Heron's book here. Uh, I always enjoy when I see photos and other images included in history books like this um, because it just makes the subject all that more um, engaging. Um, they're remarkable photos of mosaics, of historic church interiors, of antique documents, coins, and the like, um, and it just brings everything to life. Next, let's dive into Ravenna itself. Um, the, the subject matter that the book speaks of. And let's start with a question. When you think about the legendary cities of European and Mediterranean history ranging back millennia, you think of which cities? Probably Rome, probably Athens, probably Istanbul or Constantinople, um, maybe even Alexandria in Egypt, um, Milan in Northern Italy, Paris, if you're talking about a little bit more recent history, the big ones, all of which are present day mega metropolises. But do you think about Ravenna, which today is a city of just 150,000 people? Maybe not. You might not think of Ravenna. In this book, Heron argues you should. <laughs> Ravenna holds a special place in the 3,000 plus year history of the Mediterranean world, and that's really what Heron explores in this book. So why write a 400 page tome about uh, a little city like Ravenna? So there's a couple obvious answers. Um, the first and most notably is that Ravenna was a capital city of the Western Roman Empire for several decades in the fifth century, so in the 400s, roughly from 402 to the, to the middle of the, the 400s. Um, it's the city actually where the last Western Roman em emperor was deposed, Romulus Augustulus, um, and for several centuries after that, it continued to be a major power center in the Western Mediterranean and in the broader Byzantine world. Um, second, Ravenna is home to astonishing mosaic work uh, that are some of the earliest, most remarkable examples of uh, early Christian artwork. Um, these things were created almost 1,500 years ago, uh, and they are still in existence, and they are still breathtaking, and they've been maintained and protected across literally dozens of centuries, okay? Okay. Um, but Heron argues in the book that there is a deeper and a broader reason to place Ravenna among the most historically significant cities in European and Mediterranean history. Um, Heron makes a very strong case that 
from roughly the year 400 to 800, Ravenna helped transform three distinct strands of culture and power into a single thread that runs through the entirety of European history up to the present day. Uh, those three strands were, one, classical Latin slash Roman political and cultural practices, two, Eastern Mediterranean Greco-Christian Byzantine power, and three, barbarian slash Germanic socio-political cultures that originated in communities that crossed the Rhine and the Danube rivers in the 3rd, 4th, and 5th centuries AD. In essence, what Heron is saying uh, throughout the book is that when you draw a line from the Western Roman Empire to the early modern kingdom, kingdoms of Europe that shaped the Europe that we know today, that line runs directly through Ravenna. It's a compelling argument, um, and I think the book makes a strong case. Uh, to take that a bit further, Heron is arguing that the European politi political landscape of the past couple centuries was, in some ways, shaped by events that took place in and around Ravenna more than 1,500 years ago. Uh, to quote the author in the book, Ravenna was, quote, the first European city. Europe's cultural antecedents coalesced into what eventually became Europe specifically because of cities like Ravenna. Um, cities that were crossroads, that were capitals, that were marketplaces, um, and that were places of religious power. Europe has been an ongoing negotiation in this way, an often violent negotiation to be sure, since its very inception. Uh, Europe did not arise out of nowhere. It grew out of a specific set of historical circumstances, many of which were shaped um, and flowed through cities like Ravenna. So let's talk more about the book itself. Heron has structured the book into a series of relatively short chapters, sort of uh, breaking up the text, which I really enjoyed. Um, it means that you don't have to sit down for an hour or two just to feel like you pushed through a chapter and are making progress through the text. Um, you constantly feel like you're moving on to something new and learning about a new character, a new event, a new theme, or a new building. Um, it makes the pace of the book feel much more rapid, which is important, especially when you're reading a history book. Um, I'm not a scholar. I don't have to read this book, but the chapter structure made me want to keep reading. Heron has also shaped the book around a series of specific individual characters, which is another really engaging touch. So often, history narratives lose their sense of personality in favor of you know, the grand sweep of events and epochs and battles and rulers. In this book, there are over a dozen specific historic individuals that Heron zooms in on across the chapters, recreating their lives, their actions, their thoughts, and their beliefs through the fragmentary historical evidence that does exist, uh, which is pretty limited for, for this particular period. So next, I want to sketch out a few of the characters that Heron does zoom in on throughout the text. And the first is a woman named Gala Placidia. She is a fascinating character, a woman who touched many of the major episodes of the Western Roman Empire in its last century of existence. She was a daughter of Emperor Theodosius I, who ruled the Western Roman Empire in the late 300s. She was a half-sister of Emperor Honorius and a mother to Emperor Valentinian III. So she cuts across three generations of Western Roman rulers right there. And more than that, she served as empress in her own right and regent of the Western Roman Empire in her own right, ruling as emperor while her son was still a child. She was, um, just to cover a few of the interesting episodes of her life, when she was a teenager, she was taken hostage by a Gothic army in Italy. Um, this is just before the sack of Rome in 410. During this episode, she was treated rather well because of her imperial status, and she indeed married a Gothic leader during this time. Um, but she eventually then was traded back to the Romans in Ravenna uh, for 600,000 units of grain, which is a lot of grain. Placidia then 
later in her life, in her early 20s, 30s, found herself in Ravenna, where her brother, Honorius, was ruling as emperor. Honorius, uh, to put it mildly, was disinterested in the work of being a Roman emperor um, and is largely viewed by history as a failure. So when Honorius died, he left the throne of the Western Roman Empire open, and Placidia's son, Valentinian III, had the best claim to imperial rule at this time, right? So by 425, her six-year-old son had been crowned Roman emperor. So you can picture this, uh, the six-year-old emperor sitting on his throne, decked out in full imperial regalia, and his mother, Placidia, seated in a throne just next to his in the palace in Ravenna, conducting all of the business of the Western Roman Empire on his behalf. Uh, this persisted for 10 or 20 more years, depending on how you interpret the sources, well into Valentinian's adulthood. She issued laws, she enforced laws, she maintained the peace, she conducted diplomacy, she minted coins, she managed the bureaucracy, she managed the economy of an empire that while, yes, it was still declining, remained pretty vast and still powerful. And she was also a builder. Uh, during her time and her, her period of power in Ravenna, Placidia commissioned two major buildings that still to this day astonish visitors to Ravenna. The first is the Mausoleum of Galla Placidia, and the second is the Church of San Giovanni Evangelista. I have some pictures here of the Mausoleum of Galla Placidia in Ravenna, and this is a prime example. This is sort of the archetypal example of these mosaics in Ravenna uh, that Galla Placidia really helped to pioneer. You've got the starry sky on the ceiling. You've got the sort of barrel vault with the scenes from the Bible and the, uh, the rather diminutive, sort of deceptively small exterior of the building. In, in Heron's words in the book, quote, Galla Placidia is forever associated with the mausoleum in Ravenna that bears her name. With its resplendent starry sky and blue and gold decoration bordered by brilliantly colored geometric trompe l'oeil patterns, garlands of flower and fruit springing from baskets, it remains to this day one of the most beautiful burial places ever built. The mosaic decoration has ensured its place among the best known and beloved monuments of early Christendom. Galla Placidia is a truly remarkable character that I knew nothing about, virtually nothing about before reading this book. And in the broader sweep of Heron's narrative here, she embodies the synthesis of barbarian and Roman that would come to characterize the transitions that occurred in and around Ravenna in the 5th and 6th centuries. She embodied this sort of trend of creating the Europe that we know today um, in, in terms of Heron's argument in the book. Okay, so that's Galla Placidia. The next character that, from Ravenna that I want to sketch is Theodoric the Great, king of the Ostrogoths, king of Italy. Theodoric came onto the scene in Ravenna via a, a memorable and bloody episode. In 493, he was leading a Gothic army under the authority of the Eastern Emperor Zeno. So Zeno had told Theodoric and his army of Goths to go west and to reclaim uh, power and control for the Eastern Emperor over the territories of what used to be the Western Roman Empire. Um, he basically deputized Theodoric to do that. So Theodoric besieged Ravenna, um, which had been captured in 476 by Odoacer, who is a, another barbarian Hunnic king, um, who had actually deposed in Ravenna the last Western Roman emperor, Romulus Augustulus, thus bringing the Western, the Western Empire to its end. So after this siege, Theodoric and Odoacer apparently worked out a truce and a power-sharing agreement to rule Italy as partners, but that apparently quickly soured. At a banquet held to celebrate their agreement, Theodoric and his guards murdered Odoacer and his soldiers over their meal during the banquet. Uh, pretty ruthless stuff, definitely the inspiration for a scene or two in Game of Thrones that uh, came many centuries later. So thus began Theodoric's reign as king of Italy and the Ostrogoths from his seat, from his throne in Ravenna. 
Um, his reign lasted for 33 years, which is an exceptionally long reign. Um, and this was a critical period in the history of Ravenna and of the Mediterranean world more broadly. Um, in Heron's words, quote, with his grasp of the centripetal forces provoking the disintegration of the Roman world in the West, Theodoric remade an imperial style of government, becoming emperor in all but name. Like no other non-Roman chieftain, Theodoric created a hub around which later forces circled, eager to brush against his aura and carry it away to enrich their own centers of power. Theodoric's rule in Ravenna thus transformed the 5th century period of Roman collapse into a new period of early Christendom under the aegis of Constantinople. It opened a future in which the integration of Gothic and Germanic strength with Roman skills and essential features of imperial administration made Ravenna a crucible in which the alloy of Europe was formed. Key kind of phrase there at the end and re refers back to the, to the title of the book. Uh, throughout his reign, he practiced religious toleration towards uh, Catholics and towards Jews. Um, he was of a different Christian sect, the Arian Christian sect, so that was a rival of the Catholic, the, the Roman Church at the time. Uh, he rooted out public corruption. He was a trilingual leader, Greek, Latin, and Gothic. Um, he was a diplomat, um, he, and he emphasized ideals of common justice and appropriate treatment under the law that uh, had a, a long-lasting impact on European jurisprudence and legal traditions up to the present day. He was also a master builder, just like Galla Placidia, um, and his uh, sort of architectural legacy, again, is still in place in Ravenna. He erected a church, San Apollinare Nuovo, that still stands today, um, and features yet more astonishing mosaics. Now, during the time of Theodoric, these sort of gold-bricked panels featured um, mosaics of him and his court, but when the Byzantines retook Ravenna later, um, they, they sort of plastered over them with gold leaf because that was a little bit too sacrilegious for them. The takeaway for me here from the story of Theodoric is that Ravenna was home to some of the period's most talented and memorable leaders, and they played a vital role in building what would come next. Another character I want to sketch is, is not a political leader. Um, it's a, a person whose name we don't actually know. Um, it's the anonymous cosmographer of Ravenna. That's how Heron has, has chosen to, uh, to call this individual, and, and historians before her have as well. Um, he's, so in the book, Heron shines a spotlight on individuals like the anonymous cosmographer who weren't grand imperial leaders, um, and one of the most compelling of these is the anonymous cosmographer. So in the late 600s or early 700s, not sure exactly when, Ravenna nurtured a scholar who, quote, wrote a cosmographia, a geographical description of the universe in five books, unquote. He was not an explorer, not a traveler, not a soldier, but a researcher and a reader of geographic and philosophical books, which he had access to as a resident of Ravenna. Many residents of other cities, other locales in Western Europe at this time would not have had access to these types of scholarly and philosophical resources, but this individual did. So he based his study on the book of Genesis and combined that with insights from ancient Greek, Roman, uh, and more recent writings about the universe and about the Mediterranean world. In his work, in his cosmographia, he placed Ravenna at the very center of the world. So the, the book itself is, uh, the first of the five books is an account of the entire universe from its creation across the four corners of the world. The second through fourth books detail more than 5,000 cities in Asia, Africa, and Europe that were known at the time. And the fifth book is a circumnavigation narrative of the Mediterranean starting and ending in Ravenna. So according to Heron, in the anonymous cosmographer's work, quote, we can see the germs of an early medieval culture that emerges from Western Europe personified by Charlemagne with its combined Latin, Christian, and Germanic tributaries, transalpine energies wielded to those of Rome, welded to those of Rome. 
Ravenna not only nurtured expertise in Greek, but also preserved a curiosity about the physical world, mountains and rivers, as well as imperial geography. It was a fulcrum for the combination of Gothic, Latin, Greek, and Christian elements. The cosmographer was, quote, a scholar who explored the whole world from his vantage point in Ravenna. I think that's pretty cool. I think that's a really compelling character, and it was one of the most memorable aspects of the book for me. So the final character I want to talk about is a, a fairly well-known character, and it's Charles the Great, also known as Charlemagne. Um, and he's the character who Heron concludes the book with. Charlemagne was the king of the Franks uh, in the late 700s and the early 800s, and has been called by many the father of Europe. He was crowned by uh, the Pope at the time as Holy Roman Emperor, basically a successor to the Western Roman emperors of many centuries before. Um, and as he was building his power, building his sort of imperial playbook, um, he may indeed have drawn inspiration from the legacy of Ravenna and of leaders like Theodoric as he was building out his imperial kingdom. Um, he may also have modeled parts of his palace after the churches and mosaics of Ravenna. We know that he visited Ravenna multiple times. Um, we know that there is a particular building in his palace, a, a religious building, that features mosaics and stonework that are very similar to what he would have been able to see in Ravenna at the time. And in fact, Charlemagne transported many marble statues, columns, and other stoneworks from Ravenna to the capital city that, and palace that he was building in Aachen, in what is now Germany, including a statue of Theodoric on horseback which he placed right in front of the center of his palace in Aachen. So what you have here is Charlemagne, who became this Holy Roman Emperor, the successor to what was the Western Roman Empire, the father of Europe, draw, drawing directly on what had already been established in Ravenna by leaders like Theodoric to sort of build his own legitimacy, build his own prestige, and create a new visual and ceremonial language uh, for kingship in Europe. So the influence of Rome, Rome, Byzantium, and barbarian cultures were diffused into European history through Ravenna, transported into the future by leaders like Charlemagne. So that's kind of my summary of some of the characters that Heron sketches throughout the book. Now, earlier in the video, I mentioned the beautiful photos that are featured in the hard copy cover of the uh, hard cover copy of the book, and I've showed you a few of them through the video. Um, and the most arresting subjects covered by these photos are the church mosaics of Ravenna. As Heron describes in her introduction to the book, it was these very mosaics that inspired her to undertake the nine years of research that it took to write this book. Her question was pretty simple. Why are these marvelous mosaics, whose splendor and age is unequaled anywhere in Europe, located in Little Ravenna? And why have they lasted for so long? As a historian of late antiquity in Byzantium, she knew sort of the easy answer um, because Ravenna was an administrative capital, outpost of the Byzantine Empire, um, but the splendor of these millennia old mosaics inspired her to press on and thus yielded uh, this really great book. One of my favorites that I haven't featured so far, haven't shown you so far, is the imperial panel in the Church of San Vitale. Um, this is, right here, a representation of the Eastern Roman Emperor, or B Byzantine Emperor, Justinian and his Empress Theodora, and it's an archetypal image of imperial power. The crown, the robes, the Christian imagery, all of this would directly influence the form of European royalty for centuries. So you've got Justinian here with his general Belisarius, other um, political military leaders here, presenting gifts to the church represented here by different church leaders, and same with Theodora. They're wearing crowns, they're decked out, they've got the full imperial purple robes, um, they've got their, you know, their sort of entourages here. This helped establish the visual and ceremonial language that European royalty adopted for centuries. There's, you know, another line that you could draw from this 
through to Queen Elizabeth in the 21st century, wearing her crown, wearing her robes, and serving as, you know, the defender of the faith of the Anglican Church in England, right? Um, this did not arise out of nowhere. It didn't poof into existence from nothing. Um, it came from leaders like, like Justinian and his predecessors, who in fact adopted a lot of these practices from the Persians um, many centuries before. So to wrap things up, um, as my brother, who is an art professional, advised me, the mosaics of Ravenna are a foundational aspect of any art history education. Uh, I did not realize that. They were new to me when I read the book. Uh, but I am so glad that I dove deep into the history of Ravenna and of the entire Mediterranean world by reading Judith Heron's Ravenna. It's an excellent book, and I recommend it to anyone who enjoys classical history, medieval history, local histories, uh, art history, or religious history. Uh, I purchased my copy from bookshop.org, and I recommend that you do the same, or even better, buy it from your local brick-and-mortar bookshop. So that wraps up my review of Ravenna. Go out and get it. It's a great book, and thank you for watching.